everyone, and a very warm welcome to the 2021 Kundal History Prize winner ceremony, wherever you are in the world. My name is Nala Ayed, and I'm delighted to be your host for today's event, the finale of the 2021 Kundal History Prize season. My show, CBC Radio's Ideas, is a media partner of the leading international prize for history writing, and it's a pleasure to help bring the ceremony to you today. I'm here in the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the traditional venue for the Kundal History Prize Gala. It's a wonderful place, home to bold original exhibitions throughout the year, from fine arts to music and film, from fashion to design. But today, history is the star. We will be welcoming the three 2021 finalists. Rebecca Clifford joins us from the UK, Mary Favreau from France, and Marjolaine Kars from the United States. The three of them will be in conversation with the celebrated broadcaster and history hit host, Dan Snow. You will also hear from the 2021 jurors. Eric Foner, DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University. Henrietta Harrison, Professor of Modern Chinese History, Oxford University and Stanley Ho Tutorial Fellow in Chinese History, Pembroke College. And Sunil Kilnani, Professor of History and Politics at Ashoka University, Sonipat, and Jennifer L. Morgan, Professor of History in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University. And of course, their 2021 chair, historian, author, academic, and former leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, Michael Ignatieff. Michael joins us from Vienna and will announce the 2021 winner live. But first up, from here in Montreal, we're joined for a few words of welcome by the principal of McGill University, Suzanne Fortier. McGill has administered the prize since its inception in 2008. Welcome everyone and hello from Montreal. Bonjour et merci de vous joindre à nous. In 2008, McGill University alumnus Peter Kondo endowed what has since become one of the premier literary prizes in the world. 14 years on, McGill is proud to be the home of the Condal History Prize. As we celebrate our bicentennial and launch our university into its third century, we continue our mission of creating and sharing knowledge. Here at McGill, we welcome students and scholars from around the globe and strive to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion. We recognize that scholarship transcends borders, so it is fitting that the Condal Prize is open to books and authors from anywhere in the world. Much in the same spirit, the Condal History Prize plays a vital role by championing the dissemination of historical knowledge that bridges differences and builds understanding. Nos autristes finalistes et leurs ouvrages incarnent tout particulièrement cet ambitieux et important projet. I'm delighted to see the Grandel History Prize welcoming more diverse audiences every year. As we seek out and share books that will make a real impact, it is rewarding to have the public so engaged and excited. The continued success of the Grandel History Prize rests upon the shoulders of many alumni, friends, and supporters. In particular, I want to recognize the Peter Condal Foundation and the Advisory Committee. My thanks to all of you. Merci à tous d'être ici aujourd'hui. De la part de McGill et du comité organisateur du Prix Condal, je vous souhaite une excellente cérémonie. And to our three finalists, 
Bravo and congratulations. Thank you for your remarkable books and good luck from all of us at McGill. The Kundal History Prize does something quite remarkable. Open to works of history in English from anywhere in the world, including translations, it attracts more than 300 submissions every year. A jury of some of the world's most eminent historians gets to work, reading, debating, rereading, and ultimately choosing first a short list of eight, then three finalists, and impossible as it may seem, one winner. What guides them is a set of criteria that puts the bar extremely high. To be a Kundal contender, a book needs to demonstrate mastery of the historian's craft. It's an impeccably documented and well-argued study that would be at home on any academic's bookshelf. Offer a compelling narrative, which, written in lively, engaging prose, can be enjoyed by historians and the general reader alike. And be a game changer, bringing fresh perspective and original findings that significantly change our way of looking not just at the past, but also the present and future. Just how would you go about such a daunting task? Michael Ignatieff will tell us more later. Last year, I had the pleasure of interviewing Camilla Townsend. She won the 2020 Kundal History Prize for her revolutionary history of the Aztecs' fifth son. There's no doubt we'll be rewarding a very worthy successor today because our finalists are three truly outstanding works of history. Here they are with me. In the Horde, Mary Favreau chronicles the 300-year reign of the Mongol Horde and shows how their empire left a lasting trace on the history of Russia, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Rebecca Clifford, Survivors, studies the child survivors of the Holocaust from 1945 to the present day, using archives and oral interviews to understand how these children recovered from trauma, rebuilt their lives, and sought to recover their terrible past. Blood on the River is the story of a 1763 slave rebellion in Berbice, a Dutch colony in present-day Guyana. Using 18th century Dutch sources, Marjolein Kars recounts the rebellion and its bloody suppression from the perspectives of both the Dutch colonists and uniquely the slaves themselves. As for the three authors, you may have already seen them come together yesterday for the Kundal Forum, part of the two-day Kundal History Prize Festival. Mary Hunter is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at McGill University. Mary, how has this year's festival been so far? Thank you, Nala. It has been truly wonderful. We're delighted to be making these Kundal History Prize events a real fixture in the first week of December, bringing together finalists, jurors, and past winners for such stimulating, relevant conversations. A highlight, as every year, is the Kundal History Prize lecture, given yesterday by 2020 winner Camilla Townsend. Camilla's talk wonderfully complimented her book, Fifth Son, giving us a precious look into the Aztecs' lives and language and the way both continue to speak to us today. We also enjoyed the third ever Kundal Forum, which this year asks, why do we rewrite history? Our historians tackle this topic with real finesse, teasing apart the ways our ideas about the past get disrupted for better and for worse. But rather than me talking about what happened, I encourage everyone to see for yourselves. All our events are available for rewatching via the Kundal History Prize website, kundalprize.com. But for now, let's get back to the third and final festival event. I wish you all a fantastic Kundal History Prize winner ceremony. Thank you, Mary. Now let's bring in the 2021 jurors to tell you why they found their finalists to be such outstanding works of history. And let's welcome the authors themselves. Hello, Rebecca and Marie. Hello, Marjoline. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Nala. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Snow. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here again. I had a wonderful time last year. It's just as good this year. I'm in very, very equally distinguished company. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Marie. And hello, hello. Marie Elena. Hi. Uh, it's great to see you all. I've been lucky enough to talk to you individually, but it's nice to have you all on the same screen now. Let's 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 talk to you um, one by one. We haven't got any time to lose. Uh, let's start survivors with Rebecca Clifford. Let's hear what the 2021 jurors had to say about this book. 
When I read uh, Rebecca Clifford's Survivors, I was really struck by how much I didn't know before reading it um, about the idea of childhood, about the experience, the range of experience that children who were survivors of the Holocaust had, um, and the impact of those children's experience on the development of ideas about child psychology, um, ideas about child psychology and the field of child psychology. Rebecca Clifford's Survivors is both a social history of children who endured the Holocaust and what happened to them afterwards, but it's also a history of the profession of psychology. Well, there is, of course, a vast literature on the uh, Holocaust and its impact on all sorts of people and societies uh, in Europe, in the United States, etc. I think what um, she does is to really enable us to question some of the assumptions that we have developed out of previous literature, out of the oral histories, out of the remembrances. I mean, it's a study both of history and of memory at the same time, particularly through these children who are survivors of the Holocaust. It is very important that history shouldn't just be seen as a history of men and politics. In fact, when I started doing history myself, I, I in fact gave up history when I was 14 on the grounds that it was all about wars and battles and politics. Um, and this is a kind of history that I felt was a history that would tell me about the life of my mother and grandmother. It's a, it's a real history of the things that mattered. So the history of of how people thought about children in the 20th century. And that's something that's really um, important in everyday lives, how they thought that children would deal with the things that happened in their early childhood and how their ideas about that changed and how they changed in response to the Holocaust and in response to their understandings of what had happened to these survivors. This is a book that takes a huge subject, a subject about which there's been an enormous amount of writing by historians and others, and it still manages to say something new about that subject. Um, it, it brings us an entirely new angle for thinking about the Holocaust, um, and it does so in a way that is beautifully um, evidenced and documented, but also beautifully expressed and written. It takes us along, and as it takes us along the stories of these different lives, it shows us a new way of thinking about that history. And I think that's what some of the most powerful history writing can do for us. Uh, give us gives us stories to follow, but stories which open up big questions, big questions about the past, and make us understand that in a new way. Lots of high praise there, Rebecca. Um, I, it makes me think, looking at all those jurors being so wonderfully um, complimentary about your book, it, it's, it's about the essence of history itself, the great privilege that we have of knowing who we are through our histories. I think ultimately, I was thinking, you know, what, is the, what has been the takeaway for me in writing this book? And I think you've just summed it up beautifully, Dan, in a nutshell. I just couldn't stop thinking as I wrote it and, and after I'd finished it of what a privilege it is to know your own history. And we know our history, we, we know it from the beginning because we are rooted in a social world. It's the social world of our families and our communities. And, and um, you know, we don't remember our earliest years. We don't tend to remember anything before the age of three. So that social world fills it in for us. And this is a book about people who didn't have that and they've struggled and it really impressed on me just you know how deeply it's a privilege to know that your own origin story if I, unlike the other two you, you have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to archive where, where do you where do you start and stop when, when you're when you're writing a book like this i could have gone on forever <laughs> I, the part of me wants to. I don't feel finished with it. Um, but I really uh, owe an enormous amount to um, the archivists and librarians who supported me in archives whole over the world along the way. Especially, um, I'm going to give a shout out to Ron Coleman at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum because right at the very beginning, he said to me, 
Rebecca, what are you looking for? You know, what's your ideal document? And that was the most eye-opening question I've ever been asked because I didn't know. So I had to think about it really hard. And then I, I started with, with his help and the help of others to try to put together, uh, there's a there's hundred children whose lives I look at in the book. But what I do for each one is, is try to sort of drop into their lives at different points in time. So let's say, you know, kind of 1948 and 1959 and 1965. And, and as a challenge to do in the archives, we don't archive things that children create and, and we don't often archive things that just, you know, regular people going about their lives trying to make sense of their past. So every single document I found was so precious to me. Um, and, it, and it came together to allow me to kind of weave a tapestry of these lives. Well, Rebecca, you and I have talked about this before, uh, and I've tried saving all my kids' crazy artwork from school now. And, and I'm wondering, I keep thinking, I must do this, Rebecca wants me to do this. I'm like, got oh, stacks of That's useless right. art. But okay, so thank you for making me do that. Rebecca, good luck. <laughs> Marie, good to see you. you. Let's see what everybody thought about your wonderful book. Mary Favreau's The Hoods, it was a book that crept up on me slowly. When I first approached it, I thought it would be um, far too complicated to follow. Too many names uh, covering 400 years of history um, uh, and a part of the world that I really didn't know very much about. Um, but she has this extraordinary ability to make this complicated, huge span of history comprehensible, and not just comprehensible, but gripping. She changed my view of Chinggis Khan and of the um, empire that he created. But Favreau shows that this was a very sophisticated empire, a kind of empire on horseback. Um, that was as interested in trade and in exchange and, and in cultivating an area of peace where people could prosper. It was a, a really a revelation to read this book for me. The book The Horde succeeds in helping us to rethink what we mean when we talk about a state, political power, political economic authority. Uh, here she takes a, a subject which is sort of vaguely known by many people interested in history, the Horde, the Golden Horde, uh, and really explains uh, how this, these nomadic uh, groups manage to govern and dominate trade in a vast area stretching from uh, China all the way to Russia and Eastern Europe, how their presence uh, affected the history of these uh, different areas. And um, what we mean when we talk about political and economic authority. There's use of Mongolian sources, also a lot of use of Mo Russian sources, because a lot of this is about how the, um, the Horde operated when it was um, in, in Russia, in, around Moscow, but then also the languages of Islamic Central Asia. Um, so Persian is also a significant source for, for this country. It's, it's absolutely spectacular, this book, in terms of its source, the wide range of its source material, and actually going to the original sources and seeing how people spoke at the time and what they really cared about and how they understood what they were doing. Favreau brings you sort of in and out in terms of, um, you know, like intimate details about the relationship between um, Genghis Khan and his children, uh, but then really big uh, framing details about tax collection and strategic, the strategic movement of armies of thousands and ten thousands of people. Um, and so for those of us who are not familiar with this moment in time or with these people, you really get a kind of nuanced uh, uh, understanding and also it's gripping. Um, she writes in a way that makes, that sort of pulls you in uh, to the history that she is um, exploring for you. I'm just so happy that I'm not a juror. I can just enjoy your books and talk to you guys. I don't have to make any difficult decisions. It's great. Marie, amazing. You and I geeked out when we met before and we talked a lot about the geography and, and, and the, the, the physical um, parameters of this empire. Did, how, much did you, how much did you travel across this massive space? Well, 
I had to travel a lot, but that was, you know, a lot of fun too. Although when you're a student, sometimes you have to fight, you know, to get your visa and to enter the archive. So I went, of course, to Russia, to different places in Russia, Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg. I went to Kazan, which is in Tatarstan today, it's uh, Russia. Mm. And uh, I also went to Crimea, to the archive there. Um, I went to Kazakhstan as well. And actually, I went to um, Vienna, where there is a, a, a fantastic manuscript, uh, a, a, a letter, I mean, like, yeah, a manuscript uh, from the Golden Horde. So the, the thing is, there's not one place, if you want to look at the archives of the Horde, of this part of the Mongol Empire, you have to look for them everywhere. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was really, really, really long journey, I have to say. Yeah, well, that, that, that's clear from all the amazing archive you have in there. But I'm also struck by how your your understanding of the landscape changed your understanding of how, how that empire worked as well. Yes, absolutely, because uh, I, I use the documents. I'm a historian, but I also went there to see landscapes. And even if I know that some rivers, of uh, course, changed, still it was so interesting to see the river valleys where I discover, I don't want to repeat myself, but still, this was such a shock. I discovered there's water everywhere. It's all about river valleys. And uh, this changed the way I view, I, I envision uh, the Mongols, like, you know, step riders. Now they, you know, cross rivers, they, they had boats and, and that, yeah, I think that's very important. Even if you work as a historian on the archives in on earlier, earlier period, then you have to go and try to see those places, monuments also, what is left from this past. Uh, this is very important. Well, I'm very, very glad you did because you brought it all to life for us and you made me want to get out there and travel across that landscape. So good luck to you, Marie. Marie Elena, we come to you last but not least. Let's hear what the, the, the jurors had to say about your wonderful book. This is a book that utilizes a vast archive that has really never been plumbed by historians. The archive of the of a large investigation of a major slave revolt in the Dutch uh, Guiana uh, area. Um, and uh, it, it really helps us understand, really for the first time, the political mentality of slave rebels. There is a vast literature on slave rebellion, slave resistance uh, in the Americans uh, throughout, throughout the northern and uh, southern uh, hemispheres here. And, um, but uh, because of the nature of the documents she has found and because of how creatively she uses them, we feel that we hear the voice of uh, these rebellious slaves. Carr's study um is a study of a small place. And studies of small places sometimes run the risk of being overly narrow or sort of dropping you into a place um, that you can't always see its connections. But Cars is careful throughout to link uh, the, the Berbice Rebellion um, both to the revolution that happens in, in Haiti um, and also to the American Revolution. And what you get as a result is a, is, is a clear understanding of the way that ideas about freedom and demands for freedom are saturating the Atlantic world. Cars is uh, Blood on the River uh, is is beautifully written. It's it's a, a very strong narrative story, uh, but it's a narrative story that is populated with real characters, and that's very unusual for a work of history of this kind. She's able to use the archive that she finds to um, elicit the actual voices of the characters, both on the side of the enslaved rebels, but also on the Dutch uh, rulers of the colony. And uh, from those voices, she creates characters who are complex, characters who are not simply striving for some great idea like freedom, or who are simply trying to suppress uh, characters who are acting from a variety of different motivations. You might call this a niche event, but I really 
don't think that's a helpful way of looking at history. I think history is about events that tell us something and it doesn't matter whether the particular event we're describing is an event that everybody's heard of or an event that nobody's heard of. So what I learned about this, I, when I came out of the book, I didn't feel, oh, well, I, now I can talk a lot about a particular slave rebellion. What I learned was what it was like to be a slave or to be a Dutch settler at that period, how those people's lives were, how they behaved, what was driving them, what their characters were like, what kind of people they were. These are far more interesting questions than what were the events of this particular rebellion, though, of course, there's a great story going on and that's the story of that particular rebellion. Marie Elena, I loved reading your book and, and the bits of you visiting, like we talked about Marie and we and, and we've talked about um, Rebecca as well, talk, talk, talking and meeting to survivors. You went out there and you visited this site. What I'm desperate to know from you, though, because I've been obsessed with this story and I've been Googling it and trying to read all. What did the historiography look like before you came along? What, what, was, what was our understanding of this slave revolt when you embarked on this project? Well, Dan, there, there is really very little written about it. I mean, it's a rebellion that people know about in Guyana, but outside of Guyana, it's virtually unknown. And when I stumbled upon these records in The Hague, 900 testimonies of people who were questioned as they were being re-enslaved when the rebellion after an entire year did not work out, I, I was surprised to find that those uh, records had really not been used by anybody but one little uh, master's thesis in, in Dutch. And previous historians in the 19th century and in the 18th century had said, well, who wants to use these records? They're, they're the words of black people and we know that we can trust them. But of course, these records opened up uh, an amazing world. It allowed me to see inside this rebellion and write not only about how rebels and slaveholders fought each other, but how enslaved people related with each other, how they related to each other, how they envisioned their futures and how their, how their visions differed from each other. So it opened up um, a rebellion from the inside out in a, in a way that I think we often hadn't seen because in so many rebellions, they were either suppressed right away or those kinds of records no longer exist. And, and you've been able to just, just add a huge chunk of our understanding to the, the history of this Atlantic world and the Atlantic system of the 18th century. Did, 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 but I was struck, within Guyana, it's, 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 it's seen as a, a kind of found, founding event in that, in that country. Absolutely. Um, it is seen as a founding event, event, and of course, in many ways it was. It was the largest uprising in the Caribbean before the Haitian Revolution. And uh, people in Guyana have monuments to the leader of the rebellion, and people learn about it a little bit in school. But I think that they too feel that they don't know nearly as much as they would like to, in part because the records are all in Dutch, and people in Guyana now are English speaking because the colony became British Guiana in the early 19th century. And I think there's a real hunger for people to know more about this event and to know more about, about their own history. Because as you know, enslaved people like the, the survivors that Rebecca wrote about often don't have an opportunity to know much about their own histories. Yes, I enjoyed the, your description of the um, everyone thinking you were quite eccentric for asking to go and visit these places. And, and but actually, how much of the the physical geography, that the built environment, is still still in yours? Just surprisingly, quite a bit, Dan. Um, I found um, not only the sort of foundations of old plantation houses, but after it rains in Guyana, all this. Uh, pottery comes out from the ground, just begins to poke out of the mud, pieces of clay pipes and china that was both made by native people, by enslaved people, but also that was imported from China. It just came bubbling out of the earth. I couldn't believe it. And if you look on modern maps, they still, um, different pieces of land are all known by their old plantation names. So despite the fact that the jungle destroys things quickly, there is still an amazing amount of physical manifestation there. 
Wonderful. Well, listen, thank you very much, all three of you. I won't, I won't enjoy your, uh, prolong your pain anymore. Um, to everyone watching at home, these are three extraordinary works of history. I've bought them all. You should buy them all and read the whole set. And curiously, they do work, particularly this year, they work as a set for reasons that I'm not, I, I can't fully explain, but it's true. Um, over at History Hit, we've got a special extended episode with all three of these wonderful historians. Uh, you can discover more of it in depth, listen to my conversations with them. Just basically go to YouTube and, and look for History Hit Live and, and you will, you'll be able to listen to all my, my conversations with these three brilliant scholars. But for now, it's back to you, Nala. Thank you, Dan. Michael and his jurors have a daunting task in choosing one winner from these phenomenal books. Since 2008, Kundal has become synonymous with excellence in the field of history. But just who was the man who gave this prestigious prize its name? F. Peter Kundal was a man of many interests, a renowned global investor, explorer, globetrotter, sportsman, diarist, and one of the Canada's foremost philanthropists. He was also a passionate fan of history who believed strongly in its ability to help us understand our present and future. That's why he placed the Kundal History Prize at the heart of his legacy. Here now is John Rendell, Director of Grants at the Peter Kundal Foundation. John, what does this prize mean to your foundation today? Well, hi everyone, and thank you, Nala. Peter Kundal was an investor, not just any old investor, a brilliant countercultural investor who was prepared to lead the herd rather than follow it. And investment at its core is about the future. It's about laying down resources today so that we can enjoy more tomorrow. At his foundation, we also see ourselves as investors. We exist to improve the lives of children, and we mainly do that through education. So everything we fund is an investment in the future. If that's the case, the obvious question is, why are we so passionate about the Kundal History Prize? And why would Peter have been so proud of it? And the answer is very simple. The Kundal History Prize is our investment in the future of history. What do I mean by that? Well, I believe there's a new generation coming through which no longer sees history as a series of glorious victories or moments of national pride. It's a generation that's been born out of access to more globalised and democratic sources of information. We're a generation that wants to understand history warts and all, and we want to read history from perspectives that are unfamiliar. We want to know that Churchill was both heroic and deeply flawed. We want to read histories of women written by women. We want to read histories of empire written by those whose grandparents were exploited by it, not just those who benefited from it. And we want our understanding of history to be a source of wisdom and not just a source of the myths we pass on as patriots. For generations, we've accepted these myths because they protected our sense of self and if we're honest, helped paper over our insecurities. But in achieving that, they also help protect the racist, patriarchal and grotesquely unequal world we live in today. As a foundation, we care deeply about a fairer, more just future, so it makes sense that we also care about the future of history. And that's why this prize means so much to us and why we believe the work of each of our brilliant finalists is so important for the world. And now, without any further ado, here is Michael Ignatieff, the 2021 Chair of the Jury for the Kundal History Prize to reveal this year's winner. Thank you, Nyla, and hello, everyone. Your Kundal judges, Eric, Henry, Sunil, Jennifer, and I, began the judging process in May of this year. Each year, this prestigious prize receives well over 300 submissions. We took a deep breath, and by June, we'd narrowed it down from 300 to about 50, with the help of a triage committee at McGill University. By August, we'd winnowed the list down to 18. By October, the list had shrunk to eight. And now, finally, we've settled on three extremely strong finalists. We did all our discussions on Zoom, by the way, and from start to finish, it was a pleasure. Amazingly, we disagreed very little. Good writing has a way of winning over friends and silencing quarrels. 
What were we looking for? Since Herodotus and Thucydides, great history has always told a dramatic story about the past that enriches and illuminates our understanding of the present. So we look for powerful narratives that made us rethink what we thought we knew about our own times. But powerful writing alone was not enough. It had to be backed by impeccable scholarship and by the kind of painstaking attention to detail that makes it possible to hear the past speak to us. Three books stood out from all the rest and you've just heard from their remarkable authors. We were deeply impressed by Rebecca Clifford's history of the child survivors of the Holocaust. What's so remarkable about her book is its understanding that reckoning with the Holocaust for these children has been the work of their entire lives, and for some it's still not finished. These reckonings with tragedy and horror have changed as a life is lived, as memories surface, as peace is made with loss. The book is both a history of children, but it's also a history of child psychology and the efforts of adult professionals to make sense of what these resilient but often tormented children were trying to tell them. Mary Favaro's The Horde is a beautifully written, formidably researched history of the Mongols. It upended our understanding of empire. Here were a conquering people who were nomadic, constantly on the move in huge tent cities that were taken down and moved with the flocks as the Mongols traded, interact, interacted, and governed the peoples of Asia and Eastern Europe. Favreau's book will change how we understand the early history of a lot of countries, all the modern countries touched by the Mongols, in fact, Russia, of course, but also China, Turkey, Southern Europe. And finally, Marjolin Carr's Blood on the River, the untold story of a slave rebellion that took place in 1762 in Berbice, a Dutch colony on the Atlantic coast of South America. What's astonishing about this story is that the slaves succeeded in driving out the Dutch and ruled the colony on their own for a year. The colony was and the revolt was brutally suppressed. Even more astonishing is that Marjolin Kars was able to uncover trial documents in the Dutch archives in which we hear so clearly the words, thoughts, even the dreams of the leaders of the slave rebellion itself. History is about giving voice to the voiceless. And in this book, we hear the voiceless speak across the centuries. All three of these were marvelous books and a sign that history writing has never been more vigorous and exciting. But we had to make up our minds and the judges, Eric, Henrietta, Sunil, Jennifer and I, were unanimous in our choice. Superbly researched and narrated, the winning book achieves something remarkable. It transforms our understanding of a vitally important subject. And it tells a story so dramatic, so compelling, that no reader will be able to put it down. The winner of the 2021 Kundal History Prize is Marjolin Carr's for Blood on the River. Wow. Well, that's astounding thank you um I, I want to start by congratulating my my fellow finalists who wrote such absolutely fantastic books which of course would have been more than worthy of of winning this prize as was in fact every book i think that starting with the long list um and so i'm uh, i'm doubly pleased that the, the jury, which had such a large number of fascinating books to choose from, um, decided to, to give the prize to Blood on the River. I'm, I'm particularly happy that the, the prize went to a book about slavery, um, which is, after all, one of the foundational institutions of our modern world. And uh, the prestige of the Kandal Prize, I think, uh, underscores the importance of black history, the history of race and racism, which are at the moment, particularly in, in the United States, of course, under attack. Um, and so I, I think that the, the, the shot in the arm 
uh, that the Kandel Prize gives to this subject is really important. I'm, I'm also really pleased that uh, winning this prize will gain, I hope, some more attention to the um, to this major rebellion that is so little known outside of Guyana. Um, it's the largest slave uprising in the Caribbean, as I mentioned, before the Haitian Revolution. And in this day and age, I think we all need examples of courage and resilience uh, and of people who had the wherewithal to try to make their lives better at enormous risk. And I hope that the people in Guyana will feel in some measure um, supported uh, in, uh, in, in the fact that this book won a prize and, uh, and will see it as a form of recognition for what their ancestors went through. And, and largely, I hope people realize that there are amazing records in the archives in The Hague and in, in the U United Kingdom about the history of Guyana. Uh, and I hope that particularly young people in the Caribbean will, will remember that these records are here, will learn Dutch, and will go look for themselves so that we can have more books written about this subject, not just by white people from Holland, but from, from the people whose history this, this most vitally is. So I want to thank the jury for this amazing honor and everybody associated with the with the Kandel Prize. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Marie. Thank you, too. Uh, congratulations, Marjolaine, and, and thank you for this incredible book that whole jury thought it was an extraordinary achievement. And I also want to thank uh, the other two uh, authors here. Uh, you had a hell of a lot of com competition, Marjolaine, and um, so you should feel especially proud. And uh, the runners up should feel very proud of their work. It's We've done our job as jury, and now um, it's up to readers out there watching this program tonight to go out and buy all three of these books, but especially Marjolaine's. Well done. Congratulations, Marjolaine Cars, author of Blood on the River and winner of the 2021 Kundal History Prize. I had the pleasure of talking to Marjolaine for a very special episode of CBC Ideas, and you can catch it this evening at 8, 8.30 in Newfoundland or via our website, cbc.ca slash ideas, or wherever you get your podcasts. This concludes the 2021 Kundal History Prize season, but the planning for 2022 is already underway. Mary, can you give us a little sneak preview? Next year is going to be a very special one for the Kundal History Prize. It's our 15th anniversary and we certainly have a lot to celebrate. We hope to come together in person again, but be assured that the digital strand of our events is here to stay. You'll be able to join us from wherever you are in the world because the best history content should be accessible to everyone. Do make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about our plans, keep in the loop across the prize season. The Kundal History Prize is working with a network of fantastic partners to bring you the finest quality content and events, and I would like to thank all of them here. Today's event comes to you in partnership with CBC Ideas, History Hit, and Fane Productions. Special thanks to Nala Yed for being our wonderful host, and to Dan Snow for terrific interviews. À l'équipe du Musée de Beaux-Arts de Montréal, nos hôtes depuis bien des années, merci de nous avoir accueillis. And thank you to the partners who have accompanied us throughout the year. BBC History Extra, Literary Hub, and the Literary Review of Canada. And to our retail partners in Canada and the United States, Indigo and Bookshop.org. Lastly, I would like to use this moment to express deep gratitude to our 2021 jurors, Eric, Henrietta, Sunil, Jennifer, and our chair, Michael. Your work has been intensive, thorough, and thoughtful, and so very much appreciated. Thank you all for watching. Merci beaucoup. Congratulations to our winner and finalists, and all the best from Montreal. From me, Nala Ayed, here at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and from everyone who was part of our ceremony today, thank you and goodbye.